This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman with Nermeen Sheikh. We turn now to a debate on Edward Snowden's decision to leak a trove of secret documents outlining the NSA's surveillance program. In an interview with The Guardian newspaper, Snowden described why he risked his career to leak the documents. I think that the public is owed an explanation of the motivations behind the people who make these disclosures that are outside of the democratic model. When you are subverting the power of government, that, that's a fundamentally dangerous thing to democracy. And if you do that in secret consistently, you know, as the government does uh, when it wants to benefit from a secret action that it took, uh, it'll kind of give its, its officials a mandate to go, hey, you know, tell the press about this thing and that thing so the public is on our side. But they rarely, if ever, do that when an abuse occurs. That falls to uh, individual citizens. but. They're typically maligned. You know, it, it becomes a thing of these people are against the country, they're against the government. But I'm not. I'm, I'm no different from anybody else. Uh, I don't have special skills. Uh, I, I'm just another guy who sits there day to day in the office, watches what happening, what's happening, and goes, this is something that's not our place to decide. The public needs to decide whether these programs and policies are right or wrong. And I'm willing to go on the record to defend the authenticity of them and say, I didn't change these. I didn't modify the story. This is the truth. This is what's happening. You should decide whether we need to be doing this. Edward Snowden's actions have elicited a range of reactions. Jeffrey Tubin of CNN and The New Yorker writes that Snowden is, quote, a grandiose narcissist who deserves to be in prison. Democratic Senator Dianne Feinstein, chair of the Senate Intelligence Committee, said that Snowden should not be considered a whistleblower because, quote, what he did was an act of treason. And Republican Senator Lindsey Graham of South Carolina tweeted, I hope we follow Mr. Snowden to the ends of the earth to bring him to justice, language echoing what Senator Graham once said in the hunt for Osama bin Laden. Meanwhile, Douglas Rushkoff wrote on CNN, quote, Snowden's a hero because he realized our very humanity was being compromised by the blind implementation of machines in the name of making us safe, unquote. The editor of the American conservative, Scott McConnell, wrote, quote, if Obama wanted to do something smart, he should thank Snowden and offer him a job at, as a White House technology advisor. And Pentagon Papers whistleblower Daniel Ellsberg sang Snowden's praises, writing, quote, in my estimation, there has not been in American history a more important leak than Edward Snowden's release of NSA material, and that definitely includes the Pentagon Papers 40 years ago. For more, we host a debate on Edward Snowden. Is he a hero or a criminal, whistleblower or traitor? Here in New York, we're joined by Chris Hedges, senior fellow at the Nation Institute, was a foreign correspondent for The New York Times for 15 years, was part of a team of reporters that was awarded the Pulitzer Prize in 2002 for the paper's coverage of global terrorism, author, along with with the cartoonist Joe Sacco of the New York Times bestseller Days of Destruction, Days of Revolt. His most recent article is called The Judicial Lynching of Bradley Manning at truthdig.org. And in Chicago, Illinois, we're joined by Jeffrey Stone, a professor at the University of Chicago Law School. His recent piece for the Huffington Post is called Edward Snowden, Hero or Traitor. Stone served as an informal advisor to President Obama in 2008. In 1992, 20 years ago, Professor Stone hired Obama to teach constitutional law at the University of Chicago. Jeffrey Stone is also author of many books, including Top Secret, When Our Government Keeps Us in the Dark and Perilous Times, Free Speech and Wartime from the Sedition Act of 1798 to the War on Terrorism. Chris Hedges, Jeffrey Stone, we welcome you both to Democracy Now! Um, Professor Stone, I want to begin with you. Um, in your piece, you say that Edward Snowden's actions were criminal. Can you explain why you feel he should be in jail? Well, there is a federal statute that makes it a crime for public employees who have uh, been granted access to classified information uh, to reveal that information to persons who are unauthorized to receive it. So from a simple, straightforward, technical legal standpoint, um, there's absolutely no question that Snowden violated the law. Um, and from that standpoint, if he's tried, he will be convicted, and um, he is, in fact, from that perspective, a criminal. Whether one admires what he did is another question, but it doesn't have anything to do with whether or not what he did was unlawful. 
um, the question of why I think he, he deserves punishment is he said it actually himself in the clip that you played earlier. Um, he said, I'm just an ordinary guy. Well, the fact is, he's just an ordinary guy with absolutely no expertise in public policy, in the law, in national security. He's a techie. Um, he made the decision on his own without any authorization, without any approval by the American people to uh, reveal classified information um, about which he had absolutely no expertise in terms of the, the danger to the nation, the value of the information to national security. Um, that was a completely irresponsible and dangerous thing to do. Whether we think it was a positive thing in the long run or not is a separate question, but it was clearly criminal. Chris Hedges, your response. Well, what we're really having a debate about is whether or not we're going to have a free press left or not. If there are no Snowdens, if there are no Mannings, if there are no Assanges, there will be no free press. And if the press, and let's uh, not forget that Snowden gave this to The Guardian. This was filtered through a press organization in a classic sort of way. Whistleblowers provide uh, public information about uh, unconstitutional criminal activity by their government to the public. Uh, so the notion that he's just some individual standing up and releasing stuff over the internet is false. Um, but more importantly, uh, what he has exposed uh, essentially shows that anybody who reaches out to the press to expose fraud, crimes, uh, uh, unconstitutional activity, which this clearly appears to be, can be traced and shut down. And that's what's so frightening. So uh, we are at a situation now, and I speak as a former investigative reporter for the New York Times, by which any investigation into the inner workings of government has become impossible. That's the real debate. Well, Chris, how do you respond to the point uh, that Jeffrey Stone made and, and how uh, Snowden identified himself as an ordinary guy? Should any regular government employee or contractor be allowed to disclose whatever information he feels the public ought to be privy to, whether it's classified by the government and his employer or her employer or not? Well, if uh, that, that is what an act of conscience is, and uh, reporters live uh, our, our, our sort of daily fare is built, investigative reporters, off of people who within systems of power have a conscience to expose uh, activities by the power elite uh, which are uh, criminal in origin or uh, unconstitutional. And that's precisely what he did. And, and he did it in the traditional way, which was going to a journalist, Glenn Greenwald and The Guardian, uh, and having it vetted by uh, that publication before it was put out to the public. Uh, was it a criminal? Well, yes, but it was, a, uh, it was a, it, I suppose, in a technical sense, it was criminal, but set against the larger crime that is being committed by the state. Uh, when you have a system by which criminals are in power, criminals on Wall Street uh, who are able to carry out massive fraud uh, with no kinds of repercussions or serious regulation or investigation, criminals who torture in our black sites, criminals who carry out targeted assassinations, criminals who lie to the American public to uh, prosecute preemptive war, which under international law is illegal. Uh, if you are a strict legalist, as apparently Professor Stone is, what you're in essence doing is protecting criminal activity. I would argue that in large sections of our government, it's the criminals who are in power. Professor Stone, your response? Well, first of all, there, there is, so far as I can tell from everything that's been revealed, absolutely nothing illegal or criminal about these programs. They may be terrible public policy, and I'm not sure I approve of them at all, but the fact is the claim that they're unconstitutional and illegal is wildly premature. Certainly from the standpoint of what's been released so far, whether, whether Mr. Hedges likes it or not, or whether Mr. Snowden likes it or not, these are not unconstitutional or illegal programs. Let me <clears throat> go to a letter that you co-signed, Professor Stone, in 2006 with other prominent attorneys about NSA surveillance under President Bush. You were criticizing it. You wrote, quote, Although the program's secrecy prevents us from being privy to all of its details, the Justice Department's defense of what it concedes was secret and warrantless electronic surveillance of persons within the United States fails to identify any plausible legal authority for such surveillance. Balance. Accordingly, the program appears on its face to violate existing law. How do you compare that to what we're seeing today? 
they're two completely different programs. The Bush NSA surveillance program was enacted in direct defiance of the Foreign Intelligence Sur Surveillance Act. The Obama program, if we want to call it that, was approved by Congress. That's number one. Number two is the Bush program involved um, wiretapping of the contents of phone conversations. The Supreme Court has long held that that is a violation of the Fourth Amendment if there's not an individualized determination of probable cause. The Obama program, if we want to call it that, um, does not involve wiretapping. It involves phone numbers. And the Supreme Court has long held that the government is allowed to obtain phone records, bank records, library records, purchase records, once you disclose that information to a third party. And there is no Fourth Amendment violation. So they're two completely different programs. But uh, we, if you just heard our conversation with the mathematician Susan Lando, she argued that often metadata is more revealing um, than the transcript of an actual conversation. Do you think the law should change Jeffrey Stone to include this metadata? Well, I'm not persuaded by uh, her argument that it's more revealing. Um, I do believe that it's problematic, and I think, I think, in fact, there should be statutes that prohibit the gathering of this type of data by private entities as well as by the government in the absence of at least a compelling justification. Um, and I thought the Supreme Court's decisions initially on this question were wrong. So I would certainly want to see them differently. But in terms of what the law is, it's not unconstitutional, it's not illegal, and it's completely different from what the Bush administration was doing. Chris Hedges, do you agree that... Uh, well, there are plenty of lawyers who disagree with Professor Stone. Not many. Well, the ACLU has uh, just issued a lawsuit uh, over this, claiming that it's a violation of the Fourth Amendment. So uh, I haven't done a poll. Uh, frankly, the legal profession, under this uh, steady assault of civil liberties, uh, can hold its head very high. Um, there are a few out there and at the unlike, ACLU, unlike Michael Ratner and a few profession. others. But, um, you know... Uh, uh, Jeffrey Stone, aren't you on the board of the ACLU, or were you? I'm on the National Advisory Council. Yes. So what do you think of them uh, suing the government over this? I think it's great. I think that, that they, they are perfectly right to bring the question. That's their job. Their job is to challenge uh, whether or not things are constitutional, to raise those questions. That's exactly what they should be doing. Doesn't mean they're always right, but they should be presenting these questions to the courts. That's their job. That's their responsibility. Uh, Chris Hedges, one of the problems that people have pointed to is that there aren't procedures or mechanisms in place for people within the government to point out wrongdoing when it does occur. Do you think that's one of the problems that's occurred in this case with Edward Snowden? Or for that matter, your most recent article was on Army whistleblower Private Bradley Manning. Well, we used to have a mechanism. It was called the press. Uh, and we used to be able to uh, tell our sources that they would be protected uh, and uh, that they would not be investigated. Uh, for providing information that exposed the inner workings of power. Unfortunately, the press, like most institutions in this country, and I would add the legal profession, has largely collapsed under this corporate coup d'etat that's taken place uh, and is no longer functioning. And I, I want to get back that, that what this is fundamentally a debate about is whether we are going to have, through the press, an independent institution within this country that can examine the inner workings of power or not. And um, it, it is now, I mean, many of us had suspected this widespread surveillance. But now that it's confirmed, uh, we're seeing, you know, why did Snowden come out publicly? Well, because I think he knew that they would find out anyway, because they have all of Glenn Greenwald's uh, email, phone records, and everything else. Uh, and they can uh, very quickly find out who he was speaking to. Uh, and, uh, and, and whether Snowden had contact with him. Uh, and that, you know, I speak as a reporter, is terrifying uh, because it essentially shuts down any ability to counter the official propaganda and the official narrative and expose the crimes. And, and we have seen in the last few years tremendous crimes being committed by those in power. Uh, it, we have no ability now to investigate them. Professor Stone, let me ask you about whether the reporters from The Guardian and The Washington Post should be prosecuted. Uh, CNN's Anderson Cooper uh, put this question to Republican Congress member Peter King of New York last night. As far as reporters who help reveal these programs, do you believe something should happen to them? Do you believe they should be punished as well? 
Actually, if they if they willingly knew that this was uh, classified information, I think action should be taken, especially in, on something of this magnitude. I know that the whole issue of uh, leaks has been uh, uh, gone into over the last month, but I think uh, something on this magnitude, there is an obligation, uh, both moral but also legal, I, I believe, uh, against the reporter disclosing something which would uh, so severely compromise national security. Professor Stone, your response to what Peter King is saying. He's just wrong. Um, the Supreme Court in the Pentagon Papers case, for example, made very clear that Daniel Ellsberg could be prosecuted um, for, um, as a public official, stealing uh, information that The New York Times and the, and, the, and the Washington Post could not be restrained from publishing that information. Uh, the court has essentially held that although the government can control classified information at its source by prohibiting employees from revealing it, once the information goes out, it cannot then punish the press for publishing it. It's a little bit odd. as as a system, but the idea is that on the one hand, we have freedom of the press, which has to be preserved. On the other hand, the government has a legitimate interest in maintaining confidentiality at the source within the government itself. So, no, clearly uh, Grunwald and, the, and, 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 and Reuters and, and so on, none, none, none of those can be, uh, the Guardian, none of those can be punished, consistent with the First Amendment. That's clear. Uh, Professor Stone, so do you believe that uh, Edward Snowden's position uh, is comparable to Daniel Ellsberg's position with the Pentagon Papers, and that The Guardian played a, a comparable role to The New York Times? So I think Snowden's position, based upon what I know now, is much worse. Um, Ellsberg revealed uh, historical information that had really no appreciable uh, threat to the national security. Uh, it was all old information about what the government had done in the past. Um, and uh, what Snowden has, has revealed is information about ongoing programs which, we're told, uh, are extremely important to the national security, and we're told that the revelation of those programs um, makes them far less efficient. That's a very serious, potentially very serious, harm to the nation. That was not the case in Ellsberg's situation. Well, Professor Stone, so I think from that standpoint— what Henry Kissinger yes. said Dan Ellsberg was the most dangerous man in America. So they certainly, at that time, we, they were telling us that what he was doing was threatening national security. He said that at the time, before they had an opportunity to really reflect on what was released. Years later, or even weeks later, that was no longer the case. Um, so I, I think that those two situations are not remotely comparable in terms of the, the, the harm that uh, Ellsberg did to the country, which I think was trivial, relative to what Snowden has done, which arguably is far more uh, serious. Let me make another point about civil liberties here, by the way. The, it, it's extremely important to understand that if you want to protect civil liberties in this country, you not only have to protect civil liberties, you also have to protect against terrorism. Because what will destroy civil liberties in this country more effectively than anything else is another 9-11 attack. And if the government is not careful about that, and if we have more attacks like that, you can be sure that the kind of things the government's doing now are going to be regarded as small potatoes compared to what would, what, what would happen in the future. So it's very complicated asking what's the best way to protect civil liberties in the United States. I, I, have a very, I, I just don't buy this argument that, you know, this hurts national security. I covered al-Qaeda for The New York Times. And believe me, they know they're being monitored. Uh, the whole idea that somehow it comes as a great surprise to jihadist groups that their emails, websites, and phone calls are being uh, tracked is absurd. Uh, this is, we're talking about the wholesale collection of information on virtually most of the American public. Uh, and the consequences of that. Uh, are truly terrifying. At that point, we are, in essence, snuffing out the capacity of any kind of investigation into the inner workings of power. And to throw out this notion that uh, it har this harmed national security, there's no evidence for that, in the same way that there is no evidence that the information that Bradley Manning leaked in any way harmed national security. It didn't. Uh, what the security and surveillance state is doing is playing on fear. Uh, and, uh, and using that fear to accrue to themselves tremendous uh, forms of power uh, that in a civil society, in a democracy, they should never have. And that's the battle that's underway right now, and frankly, we're losing. I wanted to ask you, Professor Stone, to reflect on Martin Luther King's letter from Birmingham jail, written April 16, 1963, when he said, one who breaks an unjust law that conscience tells him is unjust and who willingly accepts the penalty of imprisonment in order to arouse the conscience of the community over its injustice is in reality expressing the highest respect for law. 
Could you respond well, to that? Obviously, King. It, sure, obviously, King is right. The question is whether it's an unjust law. Um, so, people who violate a law because they think it is unjust don't necessarily fit within the letter from the Birmingham jail. Um, King was talking about protesting racial segregation, um, and that's a little bit different in terms of the moral status of it. Now, maybe it's true. I mean, I, maybe Chris Hedges is right, and maybe that um, that Snowden is a hero, and maybe this is all a fraud on the part of the government. This, 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 this information serves no useful purpose, um, and it's fundamentally important to the United States that it's been revealed. Maybe that's true, and if it turns out to be true, then I'll be the first to say Snowden it was a hero. Um, but at the moment, I have absolutely no reason to believe that. And to say that some people act on legitimate conscience and therefore violate unjust laws is not to say that everyone who violates a law is Martin Luther King in the Birmingham jail. I want to put that question to Chris, but I wanted to ask you, Jeffrey Stone, if um, you were Edward um, Snowden's attorney, what arguments would you put forward for him right now? Um, legally, I don't think he has, honestly, I don't think he has any legal arguments that would be a defense uh, to the charge that he um, violated the law about uh, government contractors um, not disclosing classified information to persons who are not authorized to receive it. I don't think he has a defense. Um, some people commit a crime and they committed the crime. And I don't know that there's any defense sometimes. Interestingly, Dan Ellsberg faced treason trial, but uh, ultimately uh, the, uh, he ended up being exonerated because of the illegal wiretapping that was done of him. Well, he wasn't exonerated. Uh, in his case, the, the, the judge dropped the charges against him because the Nixon administration um, uh, searched his psychiatrist's office in violation of the Constitution, and the, the judge concluded that that was prosecutorial misconduct and therefore dismissed the prosecution. If the government does something similar in Snowden's case and, and, the, uh, and the court finds that it's a violation of his constitutional rights in the course of the investigation and dismisses the charges, that would be something as his lawyer I'd certainly want to know. But on the merits of the charge as, they presently, as it presently stands, um, I think it's a sentencing question, not a criminality question. Chris Hedges, if you could respond to the King quote and the significance of what Snowden did. Well, without figures like Snowden, without figures like Manning, without figures like Julian Assange, um, essentially the blinds are drawn. We have no window into what's being done in our name, including the crimes that are being done in our name. Uh, again, I, you know, having worked as an investigative reporter, the, the, the life blood of my work were figures like these who had the moral courage to stand up uh, and name the crimes that they witnessed. And these people are always at the moment that they stand up. And even King, of course, was persecuted and reviled and denounced, hounded by uh, J. Edgar Hoover, who attempted through blackmail to get him to commit suicide before accepting the Nobel Prize. Let's not forget that all of these figures, like Snowden, come under this character assassination, which, frankly, I think Professor Stone is engaging in. Uh, and that's not uncommon. Uh, that, that's what comes with the territory when you carry out an act of conscience. It's a very lonely uh, and frightening, uh, and, and it makes these figures, like Snowden, deeply courageous. Uh, because the I mean the whole debate traitor or whistleblower uh, for me I, you know hearing this on the press is watching the press commit collective suicide because without those figures there is no press I wanted to end uh, with um, with Professor Stone you were an early advisor to President Obama you gave him his first job at University of Chicago Law School you were the dean of the University of Chicago Law School what would you advise him today I think there needs to be a really careful reevaluation of the classification system. I, there's no question that we wildly overclassify, and that creates all sorts of problems, uh, for both for the press and for the ability of the government to keep secrets. Because if you try to keep everything secret, you don't effectively keep very much secret. Uh, so I think that's critical. Um, I think there is a serious question about um, how we make the trade-off between security and privacy. Um, and I think that that's an issue that needs to be addressed um, carefully, uh, certainly within the administration, within the government, uh, to the extent there are genuinely 
uh, secret policies that need to be kept secret, and I believe that perfectly possible, then I think that does not um, immunize them from serious debate by responsible people within the four corners of the administration, bringing in people who can have national security clearances uh, to take the devil's advocate position and challenge these issues. So I think there's a lot that can and should be done, um, and I think that, that it's easy to get swept up in the notion of, of security being the be-all and end-all. Um, this is a nation that's committed to individual privacy, to freedom of the press, to freedom of speech, and those values need to be respected. And I think government constantly has to be re-examining itself because all the temptations are in the wrong direction. Uh, Professor Jeffrey Stone, before we conclude, I'd like to ask you about an article you wrote in 2011 for the New York Times called Our Untransparent President. You wrote, quote, the record of the Obama administration on this fundamental issue of American democracy has surely fallen short of expectations. This is a lesson in trust us. Those in power are always certain that they themselves will act reasonably and they resist limits on their own discretion. The problem is trust us is no way to run a self-governing society. End quote. What's your assessment of the comments that you made then uh, relative to now and his Obama's record on well, transparency and civil liberties? I think the comment was correct then and I think it's, it's correct today. Um, I think that, that there's a temptation on the part of public officials to basically say we don't want to be hassled, we don't want to be bothered, we don't want to be criticized, so we'll just do what's in the best interest of the country and we don't have to tell anybody about it. And that's a huge danger in a democracy. And, and But the fact that I accept that and passionately believe it does not mean that everything the government does in confidence and in secret should not be in confidence or in secret. The problem was where to draw the line. So yes, I would criticize the Obama administration in general for being uh, uh, overly concerned with secrecy and not being sufficiently transparent. The, the point I made earlier about overclassification is a good example. Um, but at the same time, I do recognize that there are situations in which secrecy is critical. And the problem is being able to, deter, to, to discern when that's necessary and when it's not. And to do that, you need to have people within the debate who are internally challenging the necessity for secrecy and confidentiality. I don't think the Obama administration has done a very good job of that. Chris, I just, just 30 seconds, and I know that you were attending the Bradley Manning trial, but linking the two. Well, we're talking about the, the death of a free press, the death of a civil society. This is far beyond a reasonable debate. Uh, we make the East German Stasi state look like the Boy Scouts. Uh, and if we don't wrest back this power for privacy, for the capacity to investigate what our power elite is doing, uh, I think we can essentially say our democracy has been snuffed out. Chris Hedges and Jeffrey Stone, I want to thank you for being with us. Jeffrey Stone, former dean at the University of Chicago Law School, now professor there. His recent piece for the Huffington Post is called Edward Snowden, Hero or Traitor. Chris Hedges, longtime journalist, now senior fellow at the, Nas at the Nation Institute, foreign correspondent for The New York Times, before that for 15 years, uh, part of the team that won the Pulitzer Prize for coverage of global terrorism. This is Democracy Now! When we come back, we go back 50 years ago today, when Medgar Evers was assassinated. Stay with us.